I went there Monday to lead Kirtan, and it was one set of car towels that weighed about 10 pounds. <laughs> that was about the only one they had. <laughs> Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Jai Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari Radha Madhava Jai Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari
Who's that talking? missing the book, that's all. <laughs> oh, how about that? Very good. You, you are a magician. Okay, thank you. Okay. Srimad Bhagavatam, second canto, chapter six. Purusha Shukta confirmed, verse number 23. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Yadasya Nabayam Nalinad. Yadasya Nabayam Aham Mahatmanaha. Navidam Yagna Sambaran Purusha Vavayvan Rite Yadasya Nabayan Nalinad Ahamasam Mahatmanaha Navidam Yagna Sambaran Purusha Svava Vanrite Yadasya Nabhyan Nalinad Ahamasam Mahatmanaha Navidam Yagna Sambaran Purusha Vavaran Rite
Yada, at the time of Asya, his Nabayat from the abdomen, Nalinat from the lotus flower, Aham, myself, Asam, took my birth, Maha Atmanaha of the great person. Na avidam, did not know, yagya, sacrificial, sambaran, ingredients, purusa, of the Lord, avayavan, personal bodily limbs, rite, accept. So Lord Brahma is speaking. When I was born from the ab abdominal lotus flower of the Lord, Mahavishnu, the great person, I had no ingredients for sacrificial performances except the body limbs of the great personality of Godhead. I'll read it again. When I was born from the ab ab abdominal lotus flower of the Lord, Mahavishnu, the great person, I had no ingredients for sacrificial performances except the bodily limbs of the great personality of Godhead. The purport is very long, so please listen up. Lord Brahma, the creator of the cosmic manifestation, is known as Swayambhu, or one who is born without father and mother. The general process is that a living creature is born out of the sex combination of male father and female mother. But Brahma, the firstborn living being, is born out of the ab abdominal lotus flower of Mahavishnu, plenary expansion of Lord Krishna. The abdominal lotus flower is part of the Lord's bodily limbs, and Brahma is born out of the lotus flower. Therefore, Lord Brahma is also part of the Lord's body. Brahma, after his appearance in the gigantic hollow of the universe, saw darkness and nothing else. He felt perplexity, and from his heart he was inspired by the Lord to undergo austerity, thereby acquiring the ingredients for sacrificial performances. But there was nothing besides the two of them, namely the personality of Mahavishnu and Brahma himself, who was born from the bodily part of the Lord. For sacrificial performances, many ingredients were in need, especially animals. The animal sacrifice is never meant for killing the animal, but for achieving the successful result of the sacrifice. The animal offered in the sacrificial fire, so to speak, is destroyed, but the next moment it is given a new life by the din of the Vedic hymns. Hmm. Chanted by the expert priests. When such an expert priest is not available, the animal sacrifice in the fire of the sacrificial altar is forbidden. Thus, Brahma created even the sacrificial ingredients out of the bodily limbs of the Garbhadaksai Vishnu, which means that the cosmic order was created by Bada Brahma himself. Although nothing, is, although nothing is created out of nothing, but everything is created from the person of the Lord. The Lord says in the Bhagavad Gita, Aham sarvasya prabhavo batat sarvam pavartate. Everything is made from my bodily limbs, and I am therefore the original source of all creations. The impersonalists argue that there is no use in worshiping the Lord when everything is nothing but the Lord himself. The personalists, however, worship the Lord out of a great sense of gratitude utilizing the ingredients born out of the body limbs of the Lord. The fruits and flowers are available from the body of the earth, and yet Mother Earth is worshipped by the sensible devotee with the water of the Ganga, and yet the worshippers enjoy the results of such worship. Worship of the Lord is also performed by the ingredients born from the bodily limbs of the Lord, and yet the worshiper, who is himself a part of the Lord, achieves the results of devotional service to the Lord. While the impersonalists wrongly conclude that he is the Lord himself, 
the personalists, out of great gratitude, worship the Lord in devotional service, knowing perfectly well that nothing is different from the Lord. The devotee, therefore, endeavors to apply everything in the service of the Lord because he knows that everything is the property of the Lord and that no one can claim anything as his own. This perfect conception of oneness helps the worshiper in being engaged in loving service, in his loving service. Whereas the impersonalist being falsely puffed up remains a non-devotee forever without being recognized by the Lord. Om Gyan Timirandasya Gyanajana Salakaya Chaksun Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Shri Makti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinamine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gaudamani Pacharine Nirvisesa Sunyavari Pastyat Nire Sitarine Panchakalpa Turubischa Kripa Sindhu Pavacha Patitanam Pavane Bio Vaishnava Bio Namaho Namaha Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gada Darsi Vasari Gor Bhakta Rindam Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. One time Srila Prabhupada, of course he, he did it many times, but he really shocked the devotees. Because <laughs> sometimes he would be speaking in one way and then he'd speak something completely opposite to what he'd say, but it was also correct. <laughs> he would speak something one way and then he would speak the opposite and both being correct. And one time he said, you are Krishna, I am Krishna, everything is Krishna, we're all Krishna. <laughs> and devotees were, you know, oh, what happened? Prabhupada's gone crazy or something, something's, something's wrong here. <laughs> he's saying, you know, he used to say that anyone who says he's God, he's dog. <laughs> and now he's saying we're all Krishna. <laughs> But what Prabhupada was emphasizing, and then he qualified it after everybody, you know, kind of was in shock. <laughs> he said, well, ultimately there is nothing but Krishna. But we understand it in a different way. We understand that there is Krishna and Krishna's energy. For the paraphernalia that makes up the energies of Krishna, which are of extreme variety, but all of these paraphernalias are parts of his energies which are coming from him himself. So therefore, in the absolute sense of truth, everything is Krishna. <laughs> Nothing is separate from Krishna. But at the same time, then we have the idea of separate. And what is separate means when it's not connected to Krishna. And consciousness is what connects it, and consciousness is what breaks the connection. So when we see everything in relationship to Krishna, that is Krishna consciousness. And Prabhupada used the example to teach us how to become Krishna conscious. He was, he's, he took his eyeglasses and he held it up in the air. And he says, when you see these eyeglasses, what do you think of? And the devotee said, well, Prabhupada, we see that it is your eyeglasses. Prabhupada said, yes. He said, this is the understanding. When you see anything, it is actually belonging to Krishna. <laughs> it's not separate from Krishna, but it appears to be separate from Krishna. That is called maya. The appearance of the separateness is the illusionary conception of existence, which, as we know, is maya. So there's nothing separate from God, but at the same time, everything is not God. Maya tatam midam sarvam jagat avyakti mortina. Matstani sarvabhutani nateshu bhavavastita. Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, in the ninth chapter, that ultimately, I, I'm not, you know, and this material energy is working in a certain way, and I'm not there. <laughs> So why is he saying that? In order to destroy the misconception that everything is God, the pantheistic idea. So then that leads to the, the conception that if everything is God, then I'm also God. And you're God, and we're all God. Home the Mo Narayan. Glad to meet you, and Mr. Narayan. Yeah. <laughs> we all have the same name. <laughs> 
So these are the, this is the impersonalists, or the, we might say the Mayavadis, those who think everything is God. But everything, for Prabhupada would give them some credit sometimes, say everything is God and everything is not God simultaneously. So for the sake of under, so the sake of devotional service, we have to make that distinction that everything is God, but it's it's meant to be used in the service of God. In that in that connection with God, everything becomes what we say spiritualized. And then every then a devotee on the highest platform of pure consciousness sees Krishna everywhere and everything in Krishna, and that is pure Krishna consciousness. There's no distinction. But for the sake of service or the sake of activity, we make distinctions between what is, what is, what can be used in the service of the Lord and what cannot be used in the service of the Lord. Like you can't use sinful activities in the service of the Lord, because although everything is coming from God, because at the beginning of creation, Brahma created the five illusions which make up the living entity's existence in the material world. And one is the, the conception of sin <laughs> or, uh, or disobedience from the Supreme Lord, which is the definition of sin. When one disobeys the Supreme Lord, that is the foundation for the understanding of what is sinful. But ultimately everything uh, can be, is understood in, in relationship to Krishna, and that is Krishna consciousness. So when we practice seeing everything in connection with Krishna, then we're, we actually are free from the entanglement of material energy. The entanglement of material energy is when the living entity thinks themselves separate from the Lord, and their enjoyment is also created in a separate way. In other words, thinking that I can use the energy of the Lord for my own personal satisfaction separate from the activity of do devotion to the Lord. And that's the entanglement. And therefore Prabhupada says here, in the very last statement in the whole purport, he says, he says, the, the impersonalists, thinking that they're uh, ultimately God, everything is one, they become proud of this false conception and therefore they're remaining a non-devotee and they're not recognized by the Lord. In other words, they're rejected by the Lord. Because they're, they're presenting the Lord in something that is completely contrary to who the Lord is and what is it, the relationship with the living entity with the Lord. But a devotee sees everything in relationship to the Lord. And therefore, he doesn't try to enjoy anything or try to re falsely renounce everything. There are two conceptions of, of this idea that well, because I can't enjoy, let me renounce. <laughs> you know, Prabhupada would use the example of the the fox who's sitting at the base of the the the, the grapevine, and there's grapes high up on the vine. And he's jumping and jumping and jumping, and he's trying to get the grapes, but he can't. So he says, "Ah, they're sour anyway." <laughs> so yeah, we try to enjoy material energy, and then we get kicked and we find that there's, it doesn't give us the satisfaction. We say, uh, let me leave it out. So it, it's not that we give up the activity, we give up the, the wrong consciousness with trying to enjoy anything in this world. So enjoyment comes by connecting the source, the, the energy with its source. And when we connect the energy with, with its source, we connect ourselves with the source at the same time. So when we using whatever Krishna has provided in this material world, and whatever it is, whether it's uh, on the subtle platform such as intelligence and m m different states of mind, or the gross things such as our possessions, so when we use them in the service of the Lord, we connect ourselves to Krishna. And when we connect ourselves to Krishna, we're free from the suffering of material energy. and. We also elevate our consciousness to, to Krishna. In other words, we become Krishna consciousness. And what is that Krishna consciousness? That means we are happy. Or we are free from the anxiety that comes by way of the material energy. So here, Brahma, it's interesting. Krishna Prabhupada really explains this 
uh, scenario and step by step he says, well, you have Brahma, he was created by the Lord and now he wants to perform sacrifice, but there's only him and the Lord. <laughs> So in order to have a sacrifice, you need ingredients for the sacrifice. So in the same way, he used the limbs of the Lord as the elements to perform the sacrifice and in order to uh, complete the worship of the Lord. And therefore, he, he, was, uh, he understood that there's nothing outside of the Lord. The Lord provides everything. And we can also understand that in our devotional life. Whatever we need, Krishna will provide. Whatever we don't need, you may get it and you may not get it. <laughs> Sometimes you get what you don't need just to teach you you don't need it. <laughs> and that happens sometimes too. Sometimes you want something. And you know, you may not know or may not know that it's not really what you need, but because of that desire is there and the desire forces one to act, and we want something that we don't really need or we can't really use or... Something that is either something that is infatuates us or something that we're attached to. And then when we get it, we realize, I didn't need it. <laughs> or it's not going to make me happy like that. But we can always be satisfied by serving the Lord in any situation. And also depending on the Lord. Because we see, and those of you who do book distribution, you understand that Whatever, when you're out there, everything you need is provided by Krishna. He gives everything. He gives the situation, he provides the people, he gives you the intelligence you need in order to uh, perform your service. He's, he, Krishna's providing everything, all the way down, just like the example was given when Brahma um, wanted to uh, play a trick on Krishna. He didn't see, he didn't know Krishna was Krishna. You know, Krishna was sitting on the banks of the uh, Jamuna in the spiritual world with his friends, and they were enjoying lunch. And Brahma had seen Krishna kill Agasura. And, well, he heard about it, he didn't see it. And then he, when he heard about it, he was thinking, who's this little boy? <laughs> He didn't recognize him as his worship lord. So he tried to test him by stealing his friends and the calves also. And so apparently Krishna had to divert his attention away because the calves started to go away from the cows and they were running into the forest. And so the boys became anxious and they said, oh, Krishna, the calves are running away. And so um, the cows are running away. No, the cows were running away. The boys were there with the calves. And so Krishna said, don't worry, you eat your lunch, I'll be right back. So he went into the forest to find the cows. In the meantime, Brahma came and with his mystic power, apparently, and I use that word with emphasis, apparently stole Krishna's cowherd friends and the calves. He can't do it, but it seemed like he did it. And when Krishna came back, he could understood this is the, the trick of this, you know, four-headed, you know, CEO of the universe. You know. <laughs> and uh, so Krishna thought, all right. So he, Krishna knows how to ter turn a apparent, diff uh, uh, you know, a reverse situation into something very positive. So what he did is he expanded himself into the calves and the boys. And each of the boys were expanded exactly, and this is the point, as if that boy was there personally. In other words, the bodily features, their everything, their dress, and as it says, just like you have certain personality traits that are, that are what we say, uh, in, innate in your character, they call them, sometimes they call them idiosyncrasies, to use the word. He did that too. All the way down to actually how every boy acts all the time. He became exactly like that. And when Brahma came back, he didn't see anything but the same thing that he thought he had took. So the point was that Krishna is so complete in everything that he does, that nothing happens outside of him. Nothing. 
So when you know that, there's only one thing you can do, surrender. <laughs> there's only one thing you can do. When everything is Krishna, and everything is working under his control, and everything is meant for his enjoyment, and I'm connected with him, and my happiness is in relationship to him, where do you go? <laughs> it's like, you know, there's no other place to go, but okay, Krishna. I take shelter at your lotus feet. Please engage me in your service. That's all. There's nothing else. And when you don't do that, you live in what is called an illusion. It's like the story of Plato in the cave. You know that story. You know, there was a bunch of, a bunch of people inside of a dark cave. And someone comes inside the cave and says, hey, there's, you know, is, is there a bright light outside of this cave? There's no bright light. I don't see any bright light. Do you see anybody talking to each other? There's no bright light. So they're inside the dark cave, and all they see is what they, they in their environment, and they don't believe there's nothing else. And so in that illusion, and that's what's called maya, because you, you, can, you see when you preach sometimes, and you're explaining Krishna consciousness to someone, they can't get it, <laughs> because they're so covered with the material energy that that's the only thing they can understand. Somehow or other, if they have a little good fortune in their life, then they somehow or other become a little bit benefited by, by the association of devotees. But, but in that darkness of illusion, it's a different world. So that's why it says that it is what is night for the self-realized soul is a day of awakening for the conditioned living entity. And what is night for the conditioned living entity is a time of awakening for the self-realized soul. It's opposite. Devotees and non-devotees are on two different worlds completely. <laughs> Sometimes we blend with that world and we also pick up that world too. But then we see, what is there? It's just darkness because all it is is about satisfying the body and mind through a form of sense grasp. What Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, what is that verse? Hmm. Oh, Krishna, I can't remember that first word. 522 in Bhagavad Gita, who, who knows? 522. What's the first? If I know the first word, I got the verse. Yehi sam sparsa jaboga dukha yone yevate avanta vanta kunti anateshu ramate buddha. Krishna says that the sources of misery are the senses, connecting the senses with the sense objects. So people think if I connect my senses with the objects of sense gratification, I'm happy. But Krishna says no, it's opposite. It's actually the sources of misery. The devotees know that. They'll, they don't try to enjoy the senses separately. But we get such sense, sense satisfaction from devotional service that it's way beyond the happiness that the living entity experiences when there gets a little stimulation from the suffering they are undergoing by connecting the senses with some kind of object. But devotees get real sense gratification. I mean, it's the, it's the juicy stuff. <laughs> <laughs> you know, prashadam is so nice, and the holy name is so powerful, it just lifts your consciousness up. You see the deity, you think, where am I? Am I in the spiritual world? So everything is so bright, so sweet, so strong, so uplifting, that's Krishna consciousness. But why don't we taste that all the time? Because we're still trying to taste the dry, stale, chapati that is no longer fresh anymore <laughs> and that is called material it's not chapati it's just an old piece of bread uh, that is the happiness of material life so we want to taste krishna consciousness it's available we have to stop trying to taste this material world when you stop tasting there or you give up and you realize that there's no taste there it's tasteless it's like you know, 
if, if you're really hungry and you haven't eaten for a long time and someone comes along and says, here, I found this old piece of bread. It was laying in the corner and uh, looks like it's still got something to it here. You have something to eat and you'll think, oh, well, I got something to eat finally. <laughs> but then someone comes with a big maha plate with puris and halava and samosas and kachuris and sand dash and burfi and sweet rice and chutney and what else? I'm sure you can continue with the list that goes on and on. You think, well, where did that piece of bread go? I don't know. I just threw it away. <laughs> So yeah, that's Krishna consciousness. Krishna is saying, here, here's how you can enjoy. <laughs> here's the happiness you're looking for, your service to me. But stop this other nonsense. <laughs> try, to, try, try to give up the idea that there's any happiness in the material world. And that is a prerequisite for tasting the, the sweetness of Krishna consciousness. When we no longer are looking to the material world for satisfaction. And what is that satisfaction? But because of the condition of the of our our, our nature is still conditioned, and we have a tendency to go back to that. Just like I was just talking on the way here, that you know people know something is not good for them. We were just discussing it on the, but still they can't stop it. It's like people they read the pack of the cigarettes. What does it say on the cigarette pack? It causes, you know, birth, birth defects and emphysema and lung cancer. Now they got rid of that. Now it says smoking causes death, right? And it's like a big statement. You see it on the side of the package. When I go through the airports and traveling, you pass these shops and you see these cigarettes. Smoking kills, that's the word, the two words on the side. And people still buy it. And the industry is still doing good. <laughs> and people know it. But Nate Chung, Prabhupada said, I know it's right, wrong, but I still can't stop doing it. Hare Krishna, Srila Prabhupada, Ki Jai. So, yeah, that, that applies to anything in this material world that we still have that tendency to try to find satisfaction and happiness. But here, when we know everything is Krishna, but everything is Krishna, but at the same time, Krishna gives us what is it called our allotment. And that allotment is where we can use this thing in, to engage in Krishna's service. Brahma, he's in the position to... Uh, to get as much as he needs, Krishna is going to provide whatever he needs because he knows. And it's called yagya, sacrifice. This is the main part of this whole purport. He had to perform sacrifice to get what he needs. The word sacrifice comes from the Latin word sacrificio, which means to make sacred. That's the actual word. So what does that mean? When you engage something in the service of the Lord, it becomes sacred. And that is sacrifice. But then we also understood that there's another category of sacrifice, having to uh, stop or give up those things which are contrary to our progress in devotional service. And Srila Sanatana Goswami gives that statement that one has to know what is favorable for one's devotional service, anukulena, and what is unfavorable for one's devotional service. Well, anukulena and pratikul. Pratikul means those are unfavorable. When we know what is favorable and what is not favorable, then everything becomes easy. But that takes time. Therefore, we have to read the books, study the shastras, hear the classes, and sometimes understand only, only and by our own experience in devotional service. And that is the sacrifice. And, some, and therefore, in order to give up or stop doing certain things, are necessary for us to make advancement in Krishna consciousness, and that is sacrifice. 
And that sacrifice, we call it austerity. But austerity makes you strong in Krishna consciousness. When the more you perform austerity, that's in relationship to devotional service, the more you become fixed in your devotional service. Austerity leads to bhakti. Knowledge leads to austerity, not, and st austerity leads to devotional service. Austerity is even higher than knowledge in the progression towards devotional service. Because the, 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 the soul in the material world still wants to enjoy this place. And that austerity means no. Let me make Krishna the source of my enjoyment and use what he's given me in my devotional service. And that's what, Pro, that's what Brahman is doing. He's taking what he needs and he's using everything in devotional service. And here Prabhupada wants to make the point that he uses the example, those who worship the Ganges, what do they do? They take the water of the Ganges and offer it back to the Ganges with prayer. You see, if you go to India, you go to the bank of the Ganges, you know, people who worship the Ganges, they scoop up the water, they hold the water, and then they're offering a prayer, and then they go like that. The water comes back into the Ganges. So what does Mother Ganges have to do with Ganges water? It's hers. <laughs> so you're offering back. When, so devotional service simply means to give back to Krishna, what's his anyway? <laughs> and that means not only the activity, not only the ingredients, but yourself, because you belong to Krishna also. We sing that song every day. Chak hudan dilo ye, janmi janmi prabhu say, dibya gyan ride prakasita. Dibya gyan means that knowledge that tells you the truth. And what is that knowledge? You belong to Krishna. That's all. <laughs> Nowhere else. No, no, no one else. Everything belongs to Krishna. We belong to each other only when we belong to Krishna. When we connect each, ourselves with Krishna, then we have relationships with each other. Then our family relationships, our friendships, every relationship becomes an experience of happiness when we're connecting to Krishna because we see everything connected to Krishna and when we're connected to Krishna then we can actually connect everything else to Krishna and that is that is Krishna consciousness and that's the idea so nothing is separate from Krishna and we chant the holy names of the Lord right so where is the holy name coming from? Goloka Prema Dan Harinam Sankirtan it comes from the spiritual world into the hearts of the pure devotees who practice it and distribute it to all of us. So that same holy name is coming from Krishna and it's Krishna himself. So when we chant Krishna's name, we're giving Krishna back, we're giving Krishna back to Krishna. <laughs> it, but don't try that on a material level. Take somebody's possession and say, here, I'm giving it back to you. This is my gift to you. <laughs> That doesn't work. <laughs> but on the spiritual platform, everything is Krishna. So whatever you give to Krishna, he's happy to receive it. But he says, with bhakti, <clears throat> with devotion. And that's the difference. And that's the essence like that. And so one thing we can give to Krishna is we can give, we can help make others become Krishna conscious. So one of the uh, great, well, all service is equal, but one service that we do is try to think how we can bring others to Krishna conscious. So Prabhupada established that in the form of book distribution. He printed all of these books and he wanted us to distribute the books and at the same time, read the books. <laughs> Not only distribute them, but make sure you read them because you have to know what you're giving. Prabhupada criticized us in one lecture in Mayapur, 1976. He said, you're out there distributing my books. and But when someone asks, uh, my dear sir, my dear madam, what's in the book? Well, 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 our, our teacher, he writes and we sell, that's all. <laughs> that's the whole thing. And the problem is they're not like that. Learn the books. Because when you know what's in the books, when you give the books, 
you know that you're giving something very, very valuable to someone. You're giving them a chance to become happy, to become elevated, to, be, to connect with Krishna. So this book, the book distribution is so important because it actually, it's the way to uh, distribute Krishna's mercy to the fallen conditioned souls. And these are many, there are many forms of mercy that is them, but book distribution means all of a sudden we're in the arena where people are working hard simply for sense gratification. Now we're telling them how to become happy without working like an ass. Yeah, read these books, understand who you are, and then, you know, try to uh, under, practice some of this philosophy and you'll start to see a whole difference in your life. So these books are so invaluable and devotees are about to go on a book distribution marathon. When does it start? On Friday? This Friday? Hmm? 8th of July. 8th of July. Okay. And how long will it go on for? Is that, can, is, can other devotees join also? Yeah. So yes, we are taking Brahmachari team to Manchester. Whoever has got time, they can come with us. Or there will be also a group coming from the manor regularly under Divyanam Prabhu, under Vrindavan Chandra Prabhu, Kesha Gokulananda Prabhu. They will be organizing door-to-door -door and uh, also streets book distribution. Mm, good, good, good. So in other words, it's open for those who want to participate. All the numbers are available on the posters which we kind of uh, put around the temple okay. and also circulates around the WhatsApp groups. And it's on Good, the good, good. So here's a chance to, uh, you know, be an instrument for Krishna's mercy to the fallen conditioned souls. And Prabhupada said, if you preach Krishna consciousness, you immediately get recognized by Krishna. Imme immediately. It doesn't become something down the line. Yeah. Because the Lord comes to the material why world yada yada hidarmasya and to uplift the conditioned souls, to remove your religion, to give pleasure to his devotees. So he personally comes for that reason. So if we assist him in his mission by helping up to uplift the conditioned souls by giving them this transcendental knowledge. Because this knowledge is coming from the spiritual world. It's called a parushad. A parushad means it's not man-made. It's made by the Lord himself and it goes into the hearts of his pure devotees and they distribute it. <clears throat> so it's actually the greatest form of welfare work People say, well, I want to do good to others. Here's, here's the way how you can do good to others. I mean, you can give people food. That's nice, and we do that. You can also give people um, a place to stay with those who need it, or some clothing, or some medical care, education, all of these things. People do as, if, as a benefit for others. And all of these things are important. And they should continue. But when you give people transcendental knowledge and they accept it, and then their life can change for the better. And then all of their problems go away. In other words, what they're trying to solve in so many different ways is done in one way when they become Krishna conscious. <laughs> so it's so important that this knowledge be distributed. And uh, Srila Prabhupada painstakingly, and we use the word with emphasis, spent time putting these books together. He said, I, I wrote them for the devotees, but, um, but, then, but still, you must distribute them to everyone. Uh, and Prabhupada would, uh, Prabhupada's schedule was uh, usually about, Prabhupada said, I took rest between 10.30 and 11 o'clock every night. This is Prabhupada would always say that. And then he would get up at around 12.30. So he'd sleep about an hour, an hour and a half, sometimes two hours. And then when he'd get up, he would immediately begin his translation, reading the commentaries of the acharyas and working on his Bhaktivedanta purports, combining his realizations with the acharyas' uh, statements 
and then presenting the Bhaktivedanta purports. And sometimes Prabhupada would work for hours on one purport just to make it, what he called, understandable by the Western mentality. Because it needs that understanding that, <clears throat> you know, if you... If you don't, uh, if you don't have a certain, we we can, we uh, we understand things in a certain way, and so that is due to our conditioning. So Prabhupada knew that to uh, present this knowledge, we'd have to speak a little bit like the Westerners understand. And so he was able to keep the essence at the same time communicate, and in, in a way that people could understand. And that was Prabhupada's expertise. He knew how to present this knowledge according to the time, place, and candidate. So, but it was, I mean, he, Prabhupada really worked on it. So he would sometimes spend three to four hours in the morning hours just working on his Bhaktivedanta purports. And that was a time when he would be completely alone, everything would be quiet, devotees would be sleeping. And then... Uh, when it would be about 4, 4.30 in the morning, sometimes he would go to Mangalarti, sometimes he would continue with his translation. And around 6 o'clock, he'd go on morning walk, <clears throat> take his morning walk, he'd wind up at the temple to greet the deities at 7, and then at 7.30 he would sit and give the Srimad Bhagavatam class, come back to his place, take his breakfast, and then take a little rest, and then answer letters while he was getting massage throughout the whole morning, all the way up to lunch. <laughs> and then he would take his lunch, and then he would take a little rest again, and after lunch, he didn't need to meet people all day or travel and preach. Uh, Prabhupada, Prabhupada's schedule, was nobody could follow it. Impossible. Impossible. I mean, he slept an hour and a half, two hours a night, a little bit after breakfast, a little bit after lunch. And he worked tirelessly. I mean, so, I mean, the devotees would travel with Srila Prabhupada, and Prabhupada would get to the next place, and, get, and immediately he'd pick up for whatever time it was. He wouldn't rest. And whatever time it was, he, he'd resume his schedule accordingly. And the devotees would all... You know, think, oh, we're, we got jet lag, we're so tired. <laughs> Prabhupada said, you're so young, why are you so tired? <laughs> but Prabhupada was on another level. <laughs> One time, Jamuna, Prabhupada's very dear uh, uh, disciple, and she was with Prabhupada, and they were walking in Tittenhurst here in London, Lord, oh, is it uh, John London's estate? So Prabhupada would walk with her in the morning, just the two of them. And so one time she decided to walk behind Prabhupada. And then while she was doing, she was thinking, I'm going to follow in his footsteps by walking exactly where he steps. <laughs> she was getting it really exact. But then as she was looking on the ground, she couldn't see any footsteps. And this was the ground. She could see her own, but she couldn't see Prabhupada's. And then she just had to ask Prabhupada, Prabhupada, you know, I'm trying to walk in your footsteps, but I don't see any footsteps. Prabhupada said, that will be understood later. <laughs> no, he, he, not, Prabhupada wasn't part of his world, that's the point. <laughs> he came from the spiritual world directly to do this mission. And many times he exhibited some of his transcendental powers by doing something, something phenomenal. And there were many instances. But he never wanted to do that because he didn't want to devotees to see him in that light as being a powerful mystic. He was. He was a mystic also. But at the same time, he, he acted ordinarily so people would see him for who, what he wanted them to see him as the spiritual master only. But Prabhupada was really powerful. Yeah, and so uh, his books are an ex expression of his transcendental knowledge, which is coming from Krishna himself. Prabhupada would sit there 
sometimes, especially in Los Angeles, he would sit in the evening time and the devotees would gather around. Prabhupada would say, give me Krishna book. Prabhupada would sit down and then he'd pick, he'd pick a story out of Krishna book. And Prabhupada would be reading and then he'd start laughing <laughs> while he's reading. Or he would make gestures like, it's like he's reading it for the first time. And then he noticed how the devotees were, were, were kind of astonished to see Prabhupada reacting to his own books, you know. Because <laughs> when you know you, when you write a book, you write it and then you read it once, and then everybody else reads it. <laughs> Prabhupada, but Prabhupada would say, "I am simply putting the words on paper. These are Krishna's words. And that's all." But Prabhupada would you could say to use a word, he was channeling Krishna. <laughs> He could hear what Krishna was speaking and he was simply writing. That's all. So these books are coming from Krishna, ultimately, <laughs> through the pure devotee, Srila Prabhupada. Yeah. So when we know that, when we read that in that light, and at the same time when we distribute it, now we know we're, we have something very rare and very valuable. And if we can give it to others, then others will be also benefited. And that will please Krishna, that will please Srila Prabhupada. Okay, so thank you. Any questions or comments? Let's see, yes, okay. Arch, <clears throat> thank you for the class. Regarding one point which you mentioned um, about the Brahma Vimohan Lila, um, how can we reconcile that Brahma is a... I know probably you got this question <laughs> right off, right? <laughs> but Are you a this, member of the Tatvavadis? In, in a connection with, <laughs> with, uh, with, with uh, when, when uh, Brahma Samhita was revealed in the beginning of, of yeah. the creation. How can Brahma become bewildered? That's the question. And how can he have also worshipable deity, Narayan? Because that was one of the part of the Lila. That how can he have a worshipable deity? Narayan, Narayan. Narayan. Chaturbhuj, like forearm form. Well, Mahavishnu is an extension of Narayan. Mm -hmm. It describes the sequence and how these spiritual personalities unfold. Of course, they are eternal, but they manifest in a certain way. So Brahma came from Mahavishnu which who ultimately his source is Narayan. But Narayan's source is Krishna. So he's tracing it back to Narayan, that's all. But ultimately he understood that Krishna was the source of Narayan. That came later. But he didn't see it at the time. He understood the, the Supreme Lord as being Narayan. Because when he saw Krishna, he saw this little boy, you know, holding some like yogurt and fruit in his hand. It was dropping out of his hand and he was just sitting on the bank with his friends and they were just telling jokes. <laughs> That's God. <laughs> he couldn't understand the inconceivable sweet nature of the Lord that he plays like an, an ordinary person. But that's, his, that's him, that's Krishna. <laughs> So his conception was Narayan. But that, that, that Leela revealed that, that Narayan is actually coming from Krishna, and Krishna is the source of Narayan. If I may <coughs> ask another question. In Brahma Samhita, Brahma recite Venum Kvanantam Aravinda Dalaya Taksham. So he describes Krishna as Venu. He's got the, yeah. the, the flute. And he's Govinda Adipurusha. Mm -hmm. So he, in Brahma Samhita, he states, he is the supreme Govinda, the yeah. one who herds the cows. Mm -hmm. And yet, on another point, he's bewildered. And so he described him already. Mm -hmm. And then yet, when Krishna descends, he's bewildered by it. So if you can share any points. Well, he heard that this boy had... Because after Agasura was killed, all the demigods, many of the demigods saw it, and they started to have a big festival. And they were singing and dancing and loud music playing. And Brahma heard the sound. He came out of his abode to see what was going on. 
And then he realized they were, they were worshiping this little boy. <laughs> so he thought, he didn't think that this person was, you know, the Supreme Lord. Krishna, you know, Krishna is, you know, he, what is it? He says, I'm covered by my curtain of Maya. So, but we see even there are persons in spiritual groups who understand that Krishna is the Supreme Lord, but still they worship Ram, they worship Narayan, which is, Ram is an expansion of Narayan anyway. They worship Nishriga, he's also an expansion of Narayan. But that is their particular mood of worship, that's all. But still, they, they're aware that Krishna is the Adi Purusha. So Brahma is like that. And he can he glorifies Krishna as you mentioned. Vainun Kandara Vinda Dalaya Taksam Bhata Vatam Samasetam Buddha Sungaranga Kandarpa Koti Kamaniya Vishesha Sobam Govindam Adi Purusham Tamahamba Jami Govinda is Govinda is, you know, Krishna. Out of all of the names that Krishna has, Govinda is the most intimately connected name with Krishna out of all of the names. Yeah. And we connect Govinda. That's why when Lord Chaitanya made that prayer, Nam Nam Akari Bahuda Nijasarva Shakti, he said Krishna and Govinda in the translation. Practically the same. Yeah, so I don't think there's any... But Brahma tried to trick Krishna. As soon as he got that mentality, he became more bewildered. As soon as you try to play tricks on the Supreme Lord, then you, then you put yourself in a greater form of illusion. And that's what he did. He wanted to test. But Krishna showed him that, you know, your mystic power is like a firefly in the presence of a sun. You know, a firefly goes, ee, 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 and he got a little tail, and he thinks, oh, I'm really lighting up everything, you know. But then when the sun comes up, you can't even see the firefly, you know, what to speak. <laughs> it becomes so insignificant. So, yeah, so in the presence of Krishna's sun, Brahma was just like, you know, a firefly whose tail couldn't even go on, you know. So yeah, Krishna is like yeah, unlimitedly powerful. Brahma has power, but nothing like Krishna's. But it seemed to be inconceivable. How could this little cowherd boy, you know, be the supreme personality of Godhead? Thank you. Does that help? Okay. Anything else? Yeah. I have actually uh, one question about devotional service, one about Sankirtana, one about uh, book, uh, book writing. So which one? Go I ahead, whatever you... Yeah. So in, uh, let's say in Sankirtan, in Croatia, we have distributed half a million books for now, uh, at least. And uh, we are just looking like what's the effect of book distribution. So is there any uh, comments of the way how we distribute the books that kind of gives more potency to it, people start reading it more, or... Uh, how, to how to distribute the books where, well, you know, that's an individual thing because people will receive differently. You can't say there's a generic way that you can distribute and there's a, there's a generic way people will receive. People are people. People are different. So that's part of distributing books. You have to see the person you're with and see how you can reach that person. So you do a little bit of, you know, you take it and take a little inventory how to speak to this person just by looking at them. And when you talk to people, you also do that too. We speak to people according to how we understand them, you know. So I don't think there's a formula for that. It just requires to apply your observation in an intelligent way. That's all. And so, if we have distributed half a million books and we didn't see, you know, 
any like substantial results from it. Is it something that we are doing wrong regarding Prabhupada that? said my books are like time bombs, <laughs> which means that they will have an effect, maybe not immediately, but wherever the book is, it's working. Even if it's not making a person Krishna consciousness, the book is purifying the atmosphere it's in. <laughs> Because it's non-different than the Lord. And there are many people out there who have our books. And when things really get bad in the world, <laughs> they'll be start reading our books more. <laughs> That's for sure. They'll come off the shelves. <laughs> and we should remind them also like that. Like in Slovenia, I think it says that practically Everyone in Slovenia has been approached by the devotees. <laughs> the whole country. <laughs> but there's only two million people in the country. So, I mean, that's over a period of years because they do door to door and they section off the country and they go, they make sure they get every house <laughs> year by year. That's what they're doing right now. They're going on this Padiatra and they go around and, doing kirtan, and, and they combine kirtan with book distribution. And then they go from door to door. Every house. Every shop, every house. So, you might say, well, we're not making so many devotees. We're making devotees, obviously, but the fact that, that these books are there, they'll have an effect in due course of time, guaranteed. Okay, anything else, anyone? Oh yes, Mataji. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the close. I've got two questions. Uh, one question is regarding, you talked about entanglement consciousness. So if one speaks um, the truth um, about a situation, What's the clarity between the truth and upright? So I distinguish the difference. Um, yeah, the one has what? complete love and devotion of Krishna, speaks the truth, and then it's... So I, d I just want the clarity between the, speaking the truth and um, upright. Well, the truth means to repeat what is in the scriptures, what Krishna has said, what the pure devotees say, that's truth. Mm -hmm. On the material level, everything is sophistry. It's, it's half truth. <laughs> because that's why no two people can agree on the same thing all the time. It's always disagreements. So there's no truth in the material world. <laughs> I mean, there's some, but it's just, that's a relative truth. But in this, Real truth is uh, Shastra, Guru, Sadhu, the knowledge that comes from these sources, that's truth. Because truth doesn't change. Where things in the material world are true one time and not true at another time. Because of the changing element of Maya, material energy is always changing, so what is true one time is not true another time. And what is not true another time may all this will be true in a different time. But in the absolute realm, the spiritual realm, truth is never dependent on situation. It remains true all the time. Does that answer your question? So if you're speaking truth in a spiritual in environment, engine, energy, and then it's, the, what's the difference between speaking the truth and uprod? I can't see the distinction in the spiritual speaking energy. Speaking truth and, and uprod? Yeah. Uprod means something that is offensive or, I mean. But if it's the if truth, want, if, if, you, if it's if, the truth, is it classed as an offense? That's what I'm trying to distinguish. If, you, if you're speaking the truth, can it be an uprod also? No. Yeah. Well, if you insult somebody, and they may be, it may be correct what you're saying, but because you, you insulted them, it's an apparat. Right. <laughs> so that's an unnecessary truth. <laughs> so you don't do that. It's, 
you know, so we can commit offenses by speaking apparently what's true. But then there's this suchim priyam, suchim bruyam. That means to speak this truth in a way that is uh, palatable, acceptable by those you are speaking. And that's an art. <laughs> You have to learn that art, how to speak sweetly and at the same time without compromising the truth. And you see there's devotees who are expert at that. They know how to tell you you're a fool and you, and you actually like it when you hear it. <laughs> but you know, but that takes some time to learn that art. So. Thank you. Yeah, and the so, question. but better to just to. So, in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, one should truth, speak truthfully and beneficially, avoid speech that offends, quote Shastras regularly. That's called austerity of speech. Avoid truth that offend, avoid speaking that offends others. Okay, thank you. And the second question, um, if you use deviation for your personal gain, um, what's the impact on that? I didn't hear the question. If you use deviation for your personal gain in the spiritual world or material world. If you yeah. are, what is the deviation? So using deviations, tactics. Bring or, the mic down a little bit, yeah. Sorry, yeah. Deviation tactics to kind of get again your own um, advancement or spiritual. What's you what? can't do that, <laughs> it's not possible to cheat. You can cheat in the material world, you can't cheat in the spiritual realm, <laughs> it's not possible. You can try, but then you'll be cheated, <laughs> it doesn't work on the spiritual level. Everything is, is organized in such a way that when you follow it, you get the benefit. If you don't, if you do something different, you don't. That's just the way it is. Because Krishna is in the heart of all living entities. He knows everything. And Prabhupada said, you can somehow or other get, a, you can commit a crime in the material world and get away with it, but, and, but you can't hide every, anything from Krishna. He knows everything. <laughs> So you can't use any kind of other, you have to follow the process as given by a, there's no quick way to, you know, attain nirvana <laughs> or perfection. You have to follow the process. But the quick way is that when Krishna is pleased and he elevates you, he can give you special mercy and move you forward fast. He can do that. But you can't do that. You can just qualify yourself. And if Krishna is pleased, then he gives you special mercy. Then you can make fast advancement. You don't have to make try to figure out how to do it by you know by manipulating your own way. Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah, that's yeah. good. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so, oh yeah, Hare Krishna. Thank you so much, Maharaj, for a wonderful session. It was just a comment based on the question that Rishabh uh, Prabhu had asked, and you gave that response of, um, uh, yeah, you know, Prabhupada's books being a ticking time bomb, and just in my personal experience, my first contact with well, Shri Prabhupada's book was through my drug dealer. Who so, had gone through my drug dealer when I was in university? Okay. Yeah, so I had gone to you know sense gratify with my drug dealer, and then he gave me Prabhupada's Bhagavad Gita, yeah. and then from there, some or other, I ended up finding Krishna consciousness and connecting with you know Prabhupada's teachings and trying to serve. So in many ways, even if you know we might not be getting an immediate response from the people that were giving out the books, some or other, the books still work their magic and get yeah. to people's hearts. So, so I'd share that. Yeah, it's. Well, glories to your drug dealer. <laughs> have to give him some credit. <laughs> it reminds me, we were, it was one girl, she was a prostitute. 
South India. This is just a contemporary story. And somehow or other, she would read the Bhagavad Gita, and then it was time to do her service. She would stop and service her customers and go back and read the Bhagavad Gita. <laughs> and then after some time, I believe, she was also helping others to, to read the Bhagavad Gita. And then finally she gave up her occupation. But it took a while. <laughs> So these our books and our get into all places, you know, even places of ill repute, you might say, such as places of drugs and other things. So yeah, these books are everywhere. Yeah, there's one story in in India. The devotees were distributing in Mumbai. They were at the, the train station in Bombay. And there was the marathon. So the devotees were out, and so one man was walking along. So the devotee approached him, and the, the, the man waved him away. I'm not, I'm not interesting. So, and then he's walking on, and a second book distributor approaches him. And then he's all like, here they are again. So he's, again, he pushes him away. So then he goes on walking again, and a third dis different di book distributor each time came and came, and he thought, I guess it's meant for me. <laughs> After the third time, he took the book. <laughs> so we're everywhere, yeah. <laughs> we wanted to keep it like that. Wherever they t wherever they go, they see Krishna consciousness. <laughs> okay, thank you. Srila Prabhupada ki jai, Hare Krishna. Srimad Bhagavatam ki jai.